And along the way, I'll do various analogies and so on. I'll assume almost no maths knowledge. If I occasionally assume something that you don't understand, then many of us, but I'll, I'll try not to. So, okay, so the first question is going to be what would we mean by a fourth dimension? You can't point to it, obviously. Um, you might say, well, there are three spatial dimensions, left, right, forward, back, and up, down. Maybe the fourth one is time or something. But that's not a very good escape. You say, okay, what's the fifth? What's a, what is five dimensions? And then you don't have, you can't say, I'll take time. So that's some side we need to think about. And a good analogy to bear in mind is to say, what would happen if you met some creatures who lived in two dimensions? So here's some two-dimensional world, some big lake on which some bacteria or some 2D things live. And so they used to, you know, they used to the fact that to specify where, where you are, you have left, right, and up, down. And they would say the world's two-dimensional. They live on the surface of the lake. And if we met them, we might say, well, it's a third dimension. And, well, they might say, where is it? And we'd say, it's up there. But all they would see is your arm disappearing, right? They just see your arm disappearing. So that's not very good answer for them. So we would need, first of all, to be sure we can give a better answer to them. And hopefully, once we could answer to a two-dimensional person, what would it mean to have three dimensions? Hopefully then we can say, use that as an analogy to get to four dimensions and five and six and beyond. So the right way to think about these things is to borrow some ideas which came out of 18th and 19th century maths to do with complex numbers. Small sort of complex number. This is a digression, so if you don't as I'm talking about, that's okay, but still. So the idea is that complex numbers, the idea is you have a number called i. And the property that i has is that i times i, which often writes i squared, is minus 1. And it turns out that in Lots of applications like electrical circuits and so on, it's incredibly convenient to have a thing called i that squares to minus 1. Now, of course, you can't point to i on the number. Here's the number line. So there's 0, there's 1, minus 2, minus 1, there's a half, all, all real numbers. There's a number called, just after 3, there's a number called high, irrational numbers, where to do weird things, that's a number line. And nowhere on the number line is there something that squares to minus 1. Because as we all know, positive times positive is positive, and negative times negative is positive, okay? And that means 0, but 0 times 0 is 0. So wherever this thing i is, it isn't on the number line. Now, that in itself isn't an objection, because suppose you went back about 20 more centuries, you might say there's no number line, but there's numbers. 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, and so on. If you say ancient Egypt. And if someone said to you, OK, what is 3 take away 4? They would say you can't do it. They'd say there's no number which is 3 take away 4. I know you know it's minus 1, but forget that for a moment. So we might say, let's invent an amazing thing called minus 1, which is 3 minus 4. The Egyptian would say, but it isn't on my number line. We'd say, oh, I'm going to extend the number line in a clever way, an amazing idea, extend it this way, put in a thing called minus 1, and go back that way. Fine. And then we might also say, what is 3 divided by 6? We will say it's a half. If you only met whole numbers, you'd say, you can't divide 3 into 6. You can't take 3 objects and divide them 6 people equally. It can't be done. And you'd be correct in the world of whole numbers. But we'd say, ah, oh, let's invent a clever thing called fractions, right? Like a half. And then we'd say, we make the number line better by putting in a thing called a half. And so on. We get the 
No, more than one than no. That doesn't help with I, of course. So the situation where people thought of this thing called I, back in the 17th century, was they realized it was a useful tool for calculation. Should you just believe me? Well, I believe you will read textbook on electrical circuits. Um, it's a very useful computational thing to have. All kinds of things with electricity, for example. It's got, it's got actual practical use to be able to calculate with I. But um, I isn't on that line. So where is it? So people have the idea, let's have it in a different direction. So people have the following idea, it can't go on the number line, let's draw a number plane instead. So people have the idea, let's draw the usual number line here, and the kind of I number line here. So there's zero, there's one, there's two, there's three, there's minus one, there's minus two. Here is a thing called I, sort of one up. And then this thing up here we call 2i, and so on. It's fine, it's believable. Um, now, it turns out you, what you want to do with i, you don't just want to multiply by itself, you want to do something like add, you want to take 3 plus i, or 5 plus 7i. Well, the picture suggests where to put those, those things, doesn't it? You, you guess that the number 2 plus i, you put it up there, don't you? It's got a 2 part, and i, that would be 2 plus i. And I guess this number here would be minus 2 plus 2i. Two so you can make a nice picture, it's all very nice. But the problem for people in the 7th century was, this is all very well, but how do we know there is such an i? How do we know that thinking about this i doesn't get a contradiction straight away? Maybe you just can't extend numbers like that. I mean, as a very silly example, I hope we all agree that if i squared is minus 1, in other words, i, i is minus 1, if I take i to the 4, which is i times i times i times i, that is minus 1 times minus 1, which is 1, isn't it? So if I said to you, I have an amazing idea to help with some maths and with some electrical circuits, I'd like a thing called i which if it squares to minus 1, and its fourth power is also minus 1, it might be useful, but there can't be such a thing. Does everyone agree with that? I mean, assuming we're not changing the laws we already have with it. So you can't, you can't say I redefine minus 1 as minus 1 not to be 1. You can't change it now already. Okay, so again, if I said to you, we'd great to have a thing called I, which squares to minus 1 and its fourth power is minus 1, the answer is it might be great, but there's no such thing. Or, not by saying it, if there was such a thing, you deduce that 1 equals minus 1, which it isn't. So, there can't be such a thing. So, whatever dreams I have, for example, about a thing that squares to minus 1 and fourth power is minus 1, they're, they're contradictory. Whatever picture I did that wouldn't make sense. Another example of a thing where you'd like it to make sense, but you can't, people often say, you can't divide by zero, but why couldn't you? Wouldn't it be nice to extend the real numbers and allow one divide, so a new thing called, say, infinity? So the, the, the intuition is, one divided by a very, very small thing is very, very big, right? 1 divided by 100 is 100. 1 divided by 1 over a million is a million. <coughs> so if 1 over 0 is anything, it should be saying it's infinitely big. Now, OK, where's an infinite number like? Well, who knows? Maybe it's sort of off at the end or something. You might say, this is a useful thing. Perhaps I can do stuff with this. And you might even use some real life theories where you don't want to worry about exact sizes of things, you just have a size being incredibly big. The trouble is that you just can't have 1 over 0. I mean, let me show you why. Suppose 1 over 0 is infinity. I'm going to show you this, there's no such thing, you just can't have it. Again, assuming that we don't redo the normal rules of arithmetic. So if we go, let me multiply both sides by 0. Okay? So I'm clearing the fraction. So it would follow from this 
that 1 is 0 times infinity. Right? That's multiplied both sides by 0 to clear that fraction. Now, nothing wrong with that. I mean, you may say, I learned in school that 0 times anything is 0, but maybe 0 times is every big thing is 1. It doesn't look impossible yet. However, let me now double both sides. I'm going to multiply the left and the right by 2. If this is true, it's got a stage for double both sides. So, I'm doubling both sides, ready? 2 times this, 2, equals 2 times 0 times infinity. Now, what's 2 times 0? That really is 0, isn't it? So this is 0 times infinity. <coughs> Something's wrong with that, because that's 1. So we, we proved to 1 equals 2, and 1 doesn't equal 2. I hope you're accepting that. So that's why you can't divide by 0. Whatever fanciful theory you have about what's 1 divided by 0, wouldn't it be nice, wouldn't it be good, you can't have it. It leads to a contradiction. So that's the end of my digression inside a digression. I'm still in my complex numbers digression. But what I'm saying is that if you invent some nice systems that want this to be true, it's not very good if that thing is utterly impossible, at least for contradiction. Right? It's very important. I didn't say this is impossible because where on the number line is infinity. It might be totally a new number, but it's still impossible. Okay. So what people did in the 17th, 18th, an awful lot, they computed with I, and they found it was really great, and it, it actually helped them do circuits, and you can also do some structural things with engineering. You can actually, well, not by a bridge, you can basically predict when a bridge will stand up. And it works, because you do stand up. So what you do with it makes sense, but the worry was, does it lead to a competition? Is it, is it possible to have I. Maybe if you assume I times I is minus 1, and do some clever fancy footwork, you end up saying, aha, I deduced that 1 equals 2. That would be quite bad, wouldn't it? That would you can't have this I. So mathematicians were very worried about this. For about 200 years, they were worried about it. The solution they came to, which is what we're going to end up using for high dimensions, which is why this digression is happening at all. The solution they came to was to say, let's use our picture not as a picture, but as a definition. So I'm going to tell you, I'm just going to draw this picture again, but I'm going to say it differently. So this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to say, let me take the plane. I'm going to take all points in the plane and I'm going to tell you how you add and multiply them. And in that, I'm going to find, by looking carefully, a thing that does square to minus 1. Okay? So what do I do? I'm just going to draw it again. So I'm going to start off with the plane. We haven't invented really complex numbers yet, just the usual plane. So if you like, you can label a point by how far along and how far up it is. We normally call those x and y coordinates. Just as of interest, if you know what x and y coordinates are, put your hand up. Okay, one step up, fine, okay. Um, but basically, what you mean is if you go two, two along and one up, this point here, you would say that's the point. <coughs> 2, 1. It means 2 or 1. Or you might say it's left, right, it's x coordinate is 2, it's y coordinate is 1. Okay. Now, my intuition is that picture there. So my intuition is this bit here is going to be the usual real numbers. Just in, just in yellow between intuition and definition. So this bit here is going to be our usual real numbers. So, for example, this point here, which is the point two zero, 
That's row number two. This point here is the point three, zero, that's row number three, and so on. Um, and I'm thinking of this as being the point I. I'm not definitely just thinking of it as being I. I haven't, I haven't told you how to add or multiply two points yet, but in my intuition is going to be, I want this to be the point I. So I want this to be the point 2 plus i, and so on. So let me define how you add and multiply points, but without mentioning i. OK, so let's define plus as follows. What is the point a, b plus the point c, b? What should we define to be equal to? Remember, our intuition says we want this to end up being a plus b lots of i, and this one to be c plus d lots of i. So if you add them, of course, you get a plus c normal stuff, and d plus b lots of i, agreed? Which, in terms of the x and y coordinate, should be a plus c, b plus d. It always makes sense to everyone, right? Yeah, the intuition for definition is yellow for intuition, if you take a plus b lots of i and add c plus d lots of i, you get a plus c plus how many i? b plus d lots of i. That's how written over there. Okay, how about multiplying? It's, it's our choice how to define. Let's define multiplication. What is a b? Define what we like, totally our choice. Um, but I'm thinking my intuition is they're like these funny numbers with eyes. So in, in intuition, yellow mode, what should that equal? Let's have a look. I'm taking A plus B lots of I times C plus B lots of I. I'll multiply it out with the usual rules of arithmetic. Okay, yeah, the usual. Whatever acronym you have for it, the, the first times the first, the first times the second, second times first, second times second. So this is I have an AD, I have a BIC, I have an ADI, and I have a plus BIDI. Now what's that equal to? What's the ordinary part? What's the I part? Well, these bits are I bits. I've got BCIs and ADIs. Something's wrong. This is AC. Apologies. That's better. Sorry. First times the first is AC. Then it was BIC, ADI, and finally BI. I think it's right now. Okay. So that's the I part. But how about the ordinary number part? There's an AC part, and there's a that's minus B D, isn't it? So I squared minus one. So this is going to be the ordinary part is AC minus B D, and the, the I part there are BCIs plus ADIs. Remember, I'm writing this comma that. That's the point in the plane. Intuitively represent, we hope, this plus that many i just points to the plane. Okay, so here's what I've done so far. No mention of complex numbers or i. I've said take the plane, the usual plane, with an x and a y coordinate, nothing complex. I've taken the usual plane. I've on the plane defined addition and multiplication. It's a very easy check. But all the usual rules hold, like this times that equals that times this. All those we need to check. Um, I've got my lovely copy of the real. I haven't redefined stuff in the reals, have I? Because 2 comma 0 plus 3 comma 0 is indeed 5 comma 0. So I haven't cheated on the reals. So this is definitely some things as operations. So there's no contradiction in that. I've told you, there they are, I've told you they are. And finally, do we have a thing that squares to minus one? Um, let's see. 
If this is right, it's better be that point there, isn't it? So it better be the case that so question mark, take the point 0, 1, mark that by itself, equals, we hope, the number 1, that means you're the ordinary real number 1, remember the real numbers on the x-axis, so that's 1, 0. Well, let's check it. I start off with AC minus BD. How about, yeah, thank you. How about <laughs> minus? Oh, okay. Let's see if this is right. So, we first take AC minus BD, 0, 0, minus 1, 1. Yep, minus 1. Then we take BC plus AD, 1, 0, plus 0, 1, plus 0. So, we got Fantastic. So, the really important word, this is in the use of for 200 years. You may seem obvious now. We used our picture of how we wanted to represent complex numbers once we knew they were existed a free from contradiction to define them. Right? And now you can't say, why is there an i? Because the answer is it's there. <coughs> point zero comma one. And you might say, how do you know you can't prove that one equals two? Well, of course you can't, because in that picture, one isn't equal to two. Right? So it's a very important thing. We use the picture to make a definition. And once I've said, here's a number system, here's how it multiply, here's a thing that I claim squares to minus one, we just have to check it squares to minus one. Okay, so that's the end of my complex numbers digression. You can wake up again. I want to use a similar idea to explain to a two-dimensional person what three dimensions are. So here's what we'd say to our two-dimensional person. We'd say to them, in two dimensions, as you know, it's in the middle of a lake, you have things with x and y coordinates. They, they would not be to agree. Then we'd say, so as you know, each point in your world is represented <coughs> by two numbers of this comma of that. Don't we agree? Like, this point here is about the point 3 and 2. Of course, at the back of our minds, we're thinking the following. We're thinking, to explain three dimensions, we don't want to say, pick a third direction, because they know what I'm talking about. We want to say, it's given by three numbers. Right? Because if you think about it, in in our three-dimensional world, you have x, a y, and a z, don't you? That's the whole point of three dimensions. That's what three means, actually. So in our three-dimensional space, okay, it's hard to draw a two-dimensional board. <laughs> I'm sure we'll use the picture. So here's x, there's y into the board, z upwards. And points have three corners, don't they? For example, the point that says, go one to the right, go in two, and up by one, is one, two, one. You always have to you can say it in word, you can say A B C means starting from the origin, you walk A that way, B that way, C upwards. Right? Three things. And that's the key, because saying I just I'm taking three numbers, <laughs> no dimension is mentioned. So that's how you explain to a two-dimensional person what the 3D world is. You take a two-dimensional person, you say, you know how in your world you think of points as pairs of numbers? They say, they say yes. And we'd say, OK. So do you also agree, we'd say to them, that you can do all your computations just based on having a pair of numbers? And they'd say, yes. Like, the distance between two points. I, I, I hope we all know that if I tell you two points, like this is the point 4, 7, and the point 3, 9, you can work out how far they are apart, by some Pythagoras or something like that. But you, you can work it out, you don't need to draw a picture. So, what we'd say to our two dimensional person is here's how we define for you the 3D world. It is everything in the form, open bracket, three numbers, close bracket. Numbers mean normal real numbers. And they'd have to say, okay, fine. Right? They can't say, Oh, that's contradictory, or what do you mean? Where is it? Because if you just said, it's all triples. So that's 
kind of the answer of how we tell a 2D person what 3D is in a way that they know it makes sense. Maybe they can't visualize it. Right? Maybe we can't visualize a number that is 10 to the 10 to the 10 off to the right. It doesn't matter, we know what it means. So to a 3D, to a 2D person saying, you take three coordinates, that defines the original space. And if the 2D person said, okay, how do you do geometry? How do you tell how far apart two points are? We'd say, here's the distance formula. The distance from A, B, C to D, E, F is whatever square root you think it is. And then we know everything. We know what circles are, we know what distances, we know what triangles are, and so on. And again, the key thing that I'll stress yet again is that in, in that description of two dimensional friends, we only said the idea of open bracket, three numbers, close bracket. Right? We never said, think of three directions that are mutually at right angles. We didn't say that. Then it's what we're talking about. We just define it like that. Okay, right, so that's, that's the end of that analogy as well. So let's now start the talk. So the answer to what is four dimensional space is incredibly easy. It's just all, all things to form, open bracket, four numbers. That, that's all it is. I'll do that's not the end of the talk, by the way. I'll just <laughs> So, 4D space, by definition, which find to be all expressions A, B, C, D, where those are just ordinary real numbers. Okay, so here's the point of original space. The other two, 0, 0, 0, 0. Here's another point. One, two, three, four. Now, of course, you can try and say, okay, that's uh, start the origin of 40 space, go one to the right, go two north, go three upwards, and four in the fourth direction. Now, that's good, that's good intuition, of course. But if some legalistic person said, what do you mean by the fourth direction? You'd say, I don't. I just mean it's that point there. Does that make sense? And distance, by an obvious way. So if you know the distance for the three dimensions, which is you add up the squares of the core difference in square root is, it's the same three dimensions. So it's not such a distance. We'll, we'll do some calculations in a second, by the way. But that, that's how it's defined. And what's beautiful is, it is three philosophical problems. You can't say, what is the fourth dimension? So I've just told you, the entire four dimensional space is just all things with Four slots in them. And if that worries you, go back to thinking about three dimensional space. So go back to the normal space you know and love, think about it, every point on x, a y, and a z coordinate, and that therefore, to describe a point in space, any point in space, you say from the origin how far you go east, west, north, south, and up. Right? That describes it. And in some sense, the, the key to being comfortable with this is to be comfortable with the idea that the way we explain to a two-dimensional person what 3D is would be to talk about A equal B equal C. Oh, by the way, what is five-dimensional space? Not hard to explain, everything the form A, B, C, D, E. Right? Easy. Okay. Fine, that's the definition of it. Now let's see if we can actually get a feel for it and maybe do some actually calculations and see what's going on. So let me try and draw some shapes. After all, we're very used to shapes in two dimensions. We're probably used to shapes in three, but it's very hard to draw. Okay, if you ever try to draw a dodecahedron those, it's very hard to draw 3D shapes in 2D. But still, let's try and think about some shapes. Not the most beautiful. That's how 
lovely red little cube with all sides of one and so on. Anyway, of course, that isn't a cube, that's a 2D picture of you. Maybe we'll know what it represents. Here it is a solid cube. Okay, and um, we can very easily answer things about it. So I'll ask you how many corners has it got? The number of corners, there are eight of those we can see. How many edges has it got, like lines? How many edges has it got? Let's see, there are four on the bottom, four lines, four on the top, and then there are four vertical on there, <coughs> 12. And how many faces are there? Well, we just count up there. There's a top, a bottom, a left to right, and a front and back. So I think that's six. And um, just by the way, if I asked you in terms of coordinates where these things are, let's try and write down the coordinates of these points in all three of these places. Let me take the origin here, let's say, because this is the point zero, zero, zero. I can't, I'm bored of writing brackets and commas, so zero, zero, zero means the point, open bracket, zero, comma, zero, and comma, zero, close bracket. Right. What's this point? That just says step one in the x direction. So that's one, zero, zero. Just this point is one is the board, that's zero, one, zero. This point, completing that square, says go one right and one in. So that's zero, one, one. Oh, no, no, no. Notice by the way, as we'd expect, because all points I've made on the bottom so far, they'll have z coordinate zero, don't they? So they should all end with zero, and they do. Right. What's upstairs is the same as n1, isn't it? I'm going to agree to, to get from the bottom face of the cube to the top face, you just go up by one. So whenever I write here, I'm saying things there, but I, I, I make the z coordinate one rather than zero. So this is then, this becomes zero, zero, one. This is zero, one, one. This point is one, zero, one. And this is one, one, one. And just for practice, we might think to ourselves how we got to that from a 2D square, or a cube in a two-dimensional world. What's a two-dimensional world cube? It's this thing, it's a square, isn't it? And what are the coordinates in a square? Well, that's the point zero, zero. This is one, next direction, one, zero. This is zero, one, you go up. And this is you go one on one to one one. So I hope everyone can see that the way we got a 3D cube is to say, take the 2D cube and just copy it. And that, that's what cube means, it means you can copy it. Uh, note for ultra pedants, you could go down one dimension again. You, you could say the way we invented this shape is we took a one-dimensional cube and copied it in the y direction if you wanted to. You're welcome to it if you like. Correct. But the key thing I want to stress is, the way we got a 3D cube, you could just say, well, there is a stalk's glory. Or you could say, <coughs> we got it in the 2D cube by copying it again. Okay. So, let's see if we can draw a 4D cube. So there I drew a two-dimensional picture of a 3D cube. Now I'm going to try and draw a 2D picture of a 4D so, Okay, it's not the same But let's think of the ideas first of all. <coughs> I'll try and, we can say we are doing two different ways. One is to think about how I went from 2D to 3D, and then we we'll say 3 to 4. So what did we do? We took this shape in 2D, we just copied it again, didn't we, in the new direction. So if you like, in terms of picture, just, just dots and lines, I took a square, I took another square, and I joined them up. Bottom to bottom, top, top, and so on. So what's a 4D cube? Well, we 
we'll start off with the 3D cube. Now comes it's hard to draw. I'll pick a fourth directional thumbnails x, y, and z. I'll put it over here, let's say. I'll copy it again. So this was the same side. And of oh, course, it's not that, of course, because a 3D cube is two two-dimensional cubes, two squares, but with the identified thing joined up, right? Bottom corner joined to bottom corner, right to right, back to back, and so on. Really? So I'm going to also draw the connecting struts, and there'll be, remember, one from each point here, the corresponding point there. So I'm going to put a new colour for this. And I'll make them curve, because it's pretty hard to straight. So I'll uh, have a line drawing this one to this one, the line, this is the top, on the top face, the, first, the bottom point, so I draw it to that one. This, this was the absolute top, that was the one, one, one point, I draw it to the one, one point like that, and, and, and so on. Right? I, I don't, if I draw all eight, it would look very messy, I hope you can see what's going on. Yeah, so I'll try it twice for a so that's a four-dimensional cube, right? By analogy with how we got it from two to three, or three to four. This, this is the key thing. You think about four D, and you think, "Help! I'm only a three D person. How do I draw it?" It's really good to think how we get from two D to three D. Repeat it. <coughs> so that's one way to get a picture. The other way is to say, "Let's just define it. How how could we, just in terms of our coordinate systems, define a cube in?" Three dimensions. You could just say, take all points of coordinate zeros and ones. That's the shape, isn't it? What's this shape? It's all points of the plane of coordinate zeros and ones. Right? Zero or one, comma zero or one. So you could say, all in one go, you could say, fine, it's just all points in four dimensional space whose coordinates are zeros and ones. So you can have you know, points like the point O, O, one, O, O, one, 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 O, one, 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 one and so on. That being said, you take those points. Oh, how many of those points are there? Yeah, that's some counting exercise. I guess you put a zero or a one, that's two choices, pause. Whatever you've chosen, you have two choices in the second coordinate. So that's two choices times two more choices, pause. Whatever you've chosen so far, it's three choices for the third coordinate, zero or one. Three choices again, times two, which is 16. Um, makes sense, because after all, in three-dimensional world, you'd say, how many corners are there? You have first quarter zero or one, two choices. Second quarter zero or one, two choices. Third zero or one, which is eight, and which it is, so that's good. Okay. So it's your choice how you visualize it. You can either visualize it like in that weirdo picture, or you can say, I don't want to visualize it, I'll think of it as being those 16 corners and the lines of two and so on. They are the same thing, aren't they? Because after all, in terms of the coordinates, um, remember how, again, let's think back here, how did I get from 2D to 3D? I said, I put in a 2D square at height zero, z equals zero, and I put in z equals one. Same here. What do you want to call directions? X, Y, Z, W, and W is four X. We can always start with X, so I'm afraid it's W, that's the fourth thing. So what's this point? All points here should have W coordinate zero, shouldn't they? So this is the usual point zero, 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 then equal zero. What's this point? It's the usual point one, one, zero, isn't it? In the normal world. And we append it to the bottom. How about on top? Uh, what's this point? It's normally 1, 1, 1, but we're shutting in a, a W coordinate 1, so it's 1, 1, 1, 1. What's that point? That's normally the point 0, sorry, that's normally 1, 0, 0, isn't it? That says go X, and, X once, Y and Z no times. So it's normally 1, 0, 0, but we're shutting in a height 1, so it's 1, 0, 0, 1. Make sense, everyone? 
I hope you can see that what I've done with this picture is exactly describe these 16 points. Because everything I did, I put in 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, 1, followed by a 0 that's downstairs or 1 that's upstairs. And if I said to you, do what you like, but you must first name me three numbers all 0 or 1, and then, great excitement, you sound 0 or you could say 1, that's the same as saying you could have four zeros or 1, isn't it? It's the same thing. Okay. Um, can we calculate a bit? Let's see if we can calculate a bit. So in our 40 cube, how many corners do we have? We've just worked out, haven't we? A corner means a point. It's 0 or 1, 0 or 1, 0 or 1. That's 16 if you check, didn't we? Um, you could say 16 to be counted, or you could say it's the 3D answer doubled. Does that make sense? We did double it, so it is 16. Again, it makes sense. Four corners to eight corners. Okay, how many edges do we have? It doesn't sound quite so nice. Um, of course, we could just kill ourselves and try and count every single one. Let's try and speed up a bit. Um, we could say, Let's use this idea that, that we got the 4D cube from two 3D cubes, didn't we? So here are all the edges. There are the ones downstairs, but we know there are 12 of those, aren't there? The ones upstairs, there are 12 of those, it's the same thing. So 12 plus 12. And then there are also the cross edges, aren't there? And each of them are yellow lines. And there are eight of those. 12 plus 12 plus 8, which is 32. Okay, let's see if we can use our 4D expertise to do that a bit better. Um, do we agree that, well, forgetting any earlier work, there are 8 edges in direction W? Because in this direction, the root is goes down to just friend upstairs. But obviously, the cube is symmetric. There's no special direction. Right? All directions are equally good. The definition is it's everything 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, 1. So if there are 8 in direction W, there are 8 in direction X, 8 in direction Y, and direction Z. Does that make sense? So it's actually you could say, or you could say, it's 4 times 8, which is 32. That's also a lot better argument, isn't it? It's much easier. I didn't need to count that to 12. Okay, uh, luckily the same answer with our sanity. Okay, and finally, faces. So a face is like a little square, isn't it? So that's a thing like, so corners are like a dot, edges is like a line, faces is like a square. <laughs> Uh, let's try and count those. So we could just try and we could hurt our head a lot by drawing, thinking about all the faces for some up they're totally on the bottom, there are six of those, aren't there? There are six up there. Across, it doesn't sound great. I'm sure we could do it. But it looks hard to visualize. And that wouldn't work. Let me, let, let me try and do it an easier way. Um, let me ask the question. How many x, y faces are there? I mean, faces in the x, y plane. So back to the ordinary cube for, for intuition. I'm talk if I said to you, don't count faces, just count horizontal faces, there are two, aren't there? Do you agree? Then we'd say, but of course, x and y is as special as x and z and y and z, so it's two times three. That makes sense? It's great, isn't it? Right? There are two horizontal, two like this, and two like that on there. So let's count how many faces are in the direction x, y. We can see them. There's that one there, that one there, that one there, that one there, four on there. You can do it without pitch if you want by going back here and saying, 
to specify the horizontal face, an xy face, all you do is say is z. Zero or z1. It's either a two, isn't it? There are really two horizontal faces that are called the face z is zero and the face z is one. Z of x and y is an xy plane. Now here, in four dimensions, if I say the xy plane, an xy plane, to say where it is, you have to ask what's z and what's w. Make sense? This one down here is z0 and w0. This is z1, w0. Up here are the two w is 1. This bottom plane here is z is 0, but w is 1. This is z1, w is 1. So any one saying is there are four of these, either because you can see the four, or because it's 2 times 2. OK, good. Now, how many directions of faces are there? In this world, there are three. There's x, y, x, z, and y, z. How many are there here? It's more than three, isn't it? You can have an x, y plane. You can have an x, z plane. A y, z plane. You have a weird, a weird vertical x, w thing. A y, w thing. And a z, w thing. Does that make sense? So six. And, and here I suggest you don't try and visualize it. If you try and visualize these six double directional things, your heads will explode. So I just say it's six because we use symbols. That's by the part of the beauty of the symbolic approach. That first we said we defined it as just four numbers, and therefore no question of what does it mean and how to think about it. And secondly, it makes it very, very easy. So there are six directions of faces. Of course, the cube is totally symmetric. There's no bias in any direction. Think how we defined it. Everything with all coordinates 0 and 1, to we said. So if we're 4 in this direction, there's be 4, 4, 4, 4, 4, 4. Therefore, on the faces, is 4 times 6, which is 24. OK, that's quite nice. And we've been able to calculate. But actually, we've left something out of this. Um, to show what we've left out, let me go back to my idea of talking about a 3D cube to a two-dimensional person. Now remember, in the 2D world, in a shape, it's got dots and lines, isn't it? Right? If you're a 2D person, on your surface of your leg, you can have a shape like this, or a shape like this, maybe. This. You didn't have those. So if you said to a 2D person, you define the 3D cube by these triples of numbers. How many corners? They'd say, oh, eight. Then you'd say, how many lines? And they'd say, 12. Then you'd say, how many faces? What are you talking about? What's a face? And you'd say, it's a two-dimensional thing, meaning one coordinate fit, two coordinates in area. And they'd say, I can't visualize it, but I believe you. Right? Because the, the definition of 2D face means a square like that. So that's what we can there. Now what are we missing? We've worked out the kind of one-dimensional things, the edges, and the 2D things, but a 4D object also three-dimensional faces. We haven't counted the number of 3D faces. Now, what's that even mean? What's a 3D face for 4D object? Well, right, it's a cube, that's right. It, a 3D space means you fix a coordinate and see what you get. Just like here, this is a 3D object. How do you get a 2D face? You say, I'll oh, fix z to 0, z to 1. And you get 2D object, don't you? In our 4D, if I said to you, please fix w equals 0, you get a 3D cube, don't you? And, and that's a face, a three-dimensional face. Hard to visualize, I admit, but easy to understand. What it means is you fix one coordinate, three others are varying. This three-dimensional face is the part of the 4D cube given by w is fixed at zero, x, y, z, three to row. Analogy in the exact same way that this 2D face of the cube is, says z is zero, x and y for each row. Okay, it's going to last about three minutes. So let's look at how many faces there are. Uh, of course, we can't visualize it. 
it's going to get. How do you specify a 3D phase? That means you fix a coordinate 0 or 1. Now, you can make Z be 0 or 1, W be 0 or 1, and so on. So there are 8, aren't there? 2 times 4 is 8. Again, why? Because in the Z direction, there are 2, aren't there? I can make Z 0 or Z 1. In the X direction, there are 2. You can set X to 0, X to 1, and so on. So there are 8. Let's go. You can kind of see them. Well, okay, you can see the W ones, can't you? If I set W to 0 on a beautiful picture, you can see there's a W 0 cube. You can see it's a cube. W is 1, you can see over there. If you look very hard, you can see the Y is 1 cube. I set Y is 1 and X, Z, W, 3. So let's make X is 1. If I said X is 1, that means you have the right-hand part of this and the right-hand part of that. They do form a cube, don't they, in 3D? Because I've got square and square, and then I've got to show you the corresponding thing, so it is a cube. So at the expense of lots of brain power, you can actually do that. Okay, my last two things to say will be, first of all, a challenge to you guys. The challenge is, what happens in 5D? <laughs> so what about the 5D cube? So how many corners has it got? Well, that's actually pretty easy because it's always double cubes, isn't it? Always double cubes shape. That would be 32. That's no problem. How many edges are we going to investigate? How many faces, meaning things like a square? How many 3D faces, meaning things like a cube? And how many 4D faces? Actually, weirdly, this one's easy. What's a 4D face in a 5D cube? You fix one coordinate. So to specify a 4D space, face, I say Z is 0 or 1, or perhaps I say X is 0, or W is 0, or the fifth one, T is 0. So that's just 2 times 5, which is 10. You might like to think about those. Okay, and finally I'll say is, why do they don't care? What's the use in real life? Well, these pictures are incredibly useful things. For example, supposing you have some computers to connect up in a network. Of course, what do you want in a network? You want computers can talk quickly. So if I have, if I have say, 100 computers, put them all in line to be stupid, because they're not intermediate things. You could say, oh, it's silly, take 100 computers, take, take all your computers, between any two put a cable. Well, that's a lot of cables, very, very expensive, lots of good. What's in between? You'll start with not many cables, but short distances between computers. Indeed, they have the goals of the web, in fact. I'm not even making this up, it's genuine. And it turns out, if you have, say, eight computers, that's a fantastic network. It's got only 12 connectors in it. Think about it, eight computers are most three apart, aren't they? Yeah, and this is one from there, two from there. If you have six, if someone says to you have 16 computers and you want to a network with not too many connectors but, but short distances, it turns out that a 4D cube is a fantastic thing to use. Of course, it isn't actually in four dimensional space. It's you, you take 16 computers wherever they are, there they are, and you put in those connectors between them. Join it by wires. And if you have, say, a thousand computers to connect, then an incredible architecture is actually a 10 dimensional cube. So you write out, which you can't visualize it, you write out in terms of 0, 1, and let 10, work out the lines, that's a bit of computers. Actually, also inside one computer, how do different memory parts access them very well? You want your memory, similar properties, you want the memory of the computer to have lines. Not many connectors, but not big distances. That takes a lot of time. It turns out this is a very large picture. So this kind of idea 
even though you are actually doing it intellectually, is actually incredibly important for the architecture of a computer and also for how you connect computers up in a good, good network. That's one of many, many applications, but I will stop there and leave you with your homework exercise.